My name is Henning. I'm from uh, Feinsen, and I brought two colleagues of mine, uh, Mr. Christopher Auer and Mr. Maximilian Auer, not related as far as we know, but who knows. And um, yeah, today we want to show you some things of our daily work, especially talking also about Pixies, how we use the tool, and uh, yeah, what we do for our customers in projects. But first, let me please give me a few seconds to talk about our company, what we do. Um, Feinstein is a part of EDAC Engineering. Engin EDAC Engineering is one of the biggest independent engineering service providers with nearly 9,000 people working worldwide. Basically, we design and engineer cars for the o OEMs. And we as Feinstein, we are a sub-brand of EDAC and take care about the digital processes along the product development process. So, starting with the, the point where everything starts for VRAR, CAD, we call it CAX because it's not only CAD. Uh, we deal mainly with tools like CATIA and uh, Siemens NX. Then on the second vertical, we have uh, the connection of data. This is called PDM, Product Data Management. You know there are big PDM systems at the OEMs. This is also meant with that, but also small helpers that um, enables us to take data from system A and convert them to system B. And last but not least, the vertical we talk mostly today about is the experience of data, CGR, VR, and AR. So um, we thought it would be a good idea to take that, uh, these, these, uh, this, uh, this structure to, uh, to also structure our speech today. So we will talk about creating data, basically importing data, because a lot of our work, more than 90%, relies on using CAD data from uh, our multiple uh, customers. Then the connection of data, how we use tools to get additional data from the systems we need. And at the end, we want to show you an experience we built for a customer to show the whole uh, streak from creating data to the final experience. So let's start with CAD. As I told you, um, we work mainly for design departments of our customers, but also for sales and marketing. So the source for our daily work is always CAD. And as you heard today, this is, can be a real struggle to get uh, results like this. You can also uh, take a look at the whole video down at the Autotech booth. Um, but, you know, CAD is a beast. And to handle it, it takes a lot of know-how, it takes a lot of process know-how, a lot of good tools, and uh, it all relies on quality, timing, and uh, complexity at the end. So, regarding complexity, we work for a lot of OEM uh, customers, and everyone has its own CAD structure and file formats we have to handle. Then you have this huge variance of a car. When you talk about, we talk about 150% car. That means it's fully configurable, and this whole variant management is somewhere in the systems at the OEM. Um, in addition, there's the material information. Some OEMs are further than others. Some handle it that way, the others that way. So it's a really, really complex thing. And the fact that there's a change in mindset that the OEMs are more and more going towards game engines and other tools and leaving that industrial tool landscape where you build up a model and you view it in the same tool gives additional complexity to that. So we have to stay flexible to fulfill all these use cases. And of course, quality is always a topic. Marketing is very demanding. They, we have to make sure that the model looks like the customer wants to look at it. But design departments are even more because when you tell them that the virtual model is the, is the equivalent of a hardware model, then it has to look like a hardware model, and they make decisions on that, so the quality must be perfect. And of course, when you have variance in it, and for, especially for design departments, sometimes we have to bake light maps because the, the, the real-time shadows are not sufficient for making decisions there. It's, uh, it's an explosion of complexity here to handle all these light maps for different variants, so you have to think about that and find an answer. And of course, timing, uh, especially in, in, uh, in design departments, you get 
updates on the model nearly every week, every day nearly. You have to integrate it into the running uh, uh, process when you work as a service provider for the OEMs. So this is also time boxing and getting it on the point for the right, in the right time is uh, crucial. So our solution is, of course, having a very, very good data preparation pipeline. We do this since 10 years, so the pipeline is evolving every time. I, th I think it will in years still evolve, so we take always look, uh, a look what are the best tools to use. Um, and of course, sometimes we can't choose out of uh, the tool that is the best from our opinion, so we have to use tools the customer gives us. Um, but as you can see, there's a broad range of, of tools uh, we use in our pipeline, and new to that is Pixies. We look at that very closely since a few months. And um, because it's very easy, it's very easy to use, especially when you come from, uh, from other tools, not to name some, but, but it's, it's, it's very easy to get into that workflow and to use the UI, and it's very, very fast to import, which is, according to the timing problem, really, really good for us. It can handle a lot of file formats. Its tessellation quality is pretty good and you can customize it very easily, which is perfect for us because we always want to, we want to reach the automatic file conversion process, but to, to have it completely automatic, I think it's, it will take some, a while to get there, but um, it, it brings us pretty near because we can do customizing through the Python scripting. Um, so, we use Pixies basically for import of data, tessellation, reduction of data, and uh, initial UV mapping. Um, as I told in the slide before, uh, the, the, the huge amount of file formats you can import into Pixies is pretty good for us because we are not only working for OEMs, where you have mainly CATIA and NX, but we also work for Tier 1 suppliers where you get step files or Rhino 3D or iGIS or JT or something. So you have to adapt pretty fast on this landscape. And um, Pix is pretty good at that. Uh, also, when you take a look at the, at the tessellation quality, which is, which is totally sufficient for us, and um, the reduction when you increase the core deviation, um, you still get a good mesh to work with in a pretty fast speed. Um, the next feature is the, the, the hidden removal feature where you can clean the, the geometry very easily from parts you don't want. You can select if you want to delete parts, if you want to delete polygons, and it's pretty fast here. So having a reduction by nearly 50% um, is pretty good and, and, and fast to get good results. UVs in Pixies, as you can see, the UVs after tessellation directly is not what you want, but um, having this box mapping um, approach of Pixies gives you really, really good first UV setup. But as you can see on the on the right, um, when you have when you want to go in, into very details, which is important for design maybe or also marketing, you need to have manual work there. It's not feasible to have a UV setup completely out of the box, completely automatic. So we have to take care of that also in the process. I will come later to that. So our solution is not only using the best tools and processes, but we also thought of an internal, yeah, we call it a CMS, content management system, like a hub which um, holds all relevant data we need to build an experience, which is variant data, the geometry, geometry data, material distribution, shadow maps, slide maps, and all this stuff. Um, and this is pretty handy when you work in a big team and everyone is working on this source to check out data, check in data. So um, we want to tell you a little bit more, more uh, for that. So I pass over to my colleague, Maximilian. Hello. Um, I will tell you about um, how we connect our data um, we got from CRD to our, for example, Unity project. So um, we're starting in, in this part I will show you. We're starting in DataGen. Um, this means um, the data is uh, imported from CID. And we have done all material mapping, variant mapping, geometry switches, and stuff is done. So this is part from data prep. And then we have to get this model to Unity. So to this, like you can see in the expo uh, at the bottom. And we have, this is the, the whole pipeline. 
So it starts from the left to our CRD data we get from the customer. And it ends at our uh, target system, like Unity. So um, I will guide you through step by step. First, um, we have to get the data into data gen, because actually, currently, we are doing a lot of manual setup to clean up this data, to tessellate it, to uh, reduce the data. And that's where pixies come in. So we're like, um, evaluating how good we can use it in our process. And because of the uh, Python scripting API, uh, Pixies gives us, we can do a lot of things we're currently doing manually, but this is uh, something which is Pixies very great at. So um, we have to do uh, one thing I forgot to mention is that we have to do um, a generic UV layout. And this is something uh, Pixies is good at, as Henning told you before, but there's some stuff we have to do manually. So for this, we are going into Maya. Um, using Maya to unwrap our UVs, we do not can create um, on the fly. And uh, as Henning told you too, uh, to light bake. So if we have the um, challenge to do a physically based correct rendering, uh, we do it with V-Ray and feeding the light maps into Unity and recreating um, the animation rigs and stuff also in Maya. Sorry, so maybe for adding, um, why we do we do this in Maya? Of course, you can do light maps also in, in Unity or in other game engines, but the fastest, fastness of, of V-Ray and the, our artists are very known to work in, 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 in Maya and with the light setup and all this makes it much easier to do this in, in Maya with V-Ray, but we see Light, uh, light, light mapping and, and, and um, all these features with uh, Unity 2018 it improves very much, so yeah. we also look into doing that directly in the game engine. Yeah. Sure. Um, from the system like DataGen or Maya, we have plugins that to connect to our data se service. So it's like um, a MySQL database, and we're using a REST API to send data to the database. And this database, um, I have a little example, um, connects all the data you have. So for example, the, um, I would say a steering wheel has a ladder on it, and the ladder is saved to the database. So we know the geometry has this ladder on it, on it, and also the file behind the ladder, for example, in this case, the shader, and the textures that needed to render it in our target uh, program is also saved. So this allows us to import this asset in every target system we want to and reconstruct this material. So it's easy. You do not have to have your, um, your material library in your project, but it is also it is saved on the, fi on the file and it can import into Unity at runtime. So to get this data to our target system, um, it also using the REST API. That's um, convenient because you, our programmer know how to get data into the database and how to get it out. It's the same interface. And last but not least, we have the target systems uh, like Unity, Unreal, Maya, Vivet, um, which then uses the data from the database and also from uh, the file system the, um, to Im automatically import the assets assigns correct materials to write metadata we need to um, reconstruct variant sets and stuff like this, and creates, in our case, a prefab which can use, our designer can use in their experience they want to create. So now I will show you uh, this process in a short little demo. Um, for this, I prepared. Hmm. No. no. Uh, and data shan scene. That's um, a steering wheel from the Turek we did at the expo. And this is a setup file, so it is uh, configured. The materials are mapped, um, metadata is written to it. And now we have a database, and we can say I want to, um, for example, write a steering wheel, that's the asset I'm currently working on, to our database and export it. Um, you define an export path, and all you do is hit export. That's sending the data to the database, also exporting our FBX files, 
and sending it to a file system. Now, in Unity, I have the counterpart. I can open our, uh, our tool, see all the geometries that got exported, can select them and import them. So now, every geometry will be imported. The meta files, which uh, are written to the database, uh, can be put into account to map the, real, the correct material to uh, assign, uh, I would say, um, animation groups so that you can later know, OK, these two geometries are, in, for example, a door, and I can animate them uh, independently. And, sorry for interrupting, but also um, in case of performance, you have to combine and to merge uh, geometry on the viewer I will side. To that oh, okay, sorry. Yeah. So um, now we have our steering wheel in Unity, and I can uh, drag the steering wheel into Unity, and I have all my geometries and materials in Unity. Um, as you can see here, um, these are the materials that got exported, and this is just a basic setup how it would look like. But what the cool part is is now I would say we're going to a review with our customer and they're saying, ah, we don't like the material on the steering wheel. Please make it a leather. So we're going like, okay, oops. We are putting a leather on it. So that's all easy to do. And for in this example in Delta Gen, and we can uh, work through the whole car and fix our material errors that are occurring. And all I have to do is just export it again. And now I can go into Unity and say, OK, which part was updated? For example, this one. And I will quickly select it. And go in our tool, take it, import it, got updated, and has the new material on it. Um, that's pretty cool because our designers does not have to think about how they got their material, how they get their material on the mesh. So it's like, OK, I import this car. This is the configuration I have to work on. And it's done, and it's ready, and it's correctly. So yeah, and um, that was what I want to show you. Um, currently, we're working on uh, getting CATIA data, for example, uh, in this case, kinematics, into Unity. And we have, um, I would say, a process we created that you can save your Gatia kinematic to a replay. And this replay gets written as an animation to the FBX. And I will show you this too. So in this example, we have Where is it? So yeah, is while you're loading, the idea basically is that, that you have the kinematics already in your CAD system, and the engineers had put a lot of effort in it to get it into the CAD system. So why to rebuild it again when you do keying? So we thought about that, and we said the information is there, so why don't we use it and do the animation directly to Unity or other file formats? So this is actually a product you can buy at FineZen, and it's very easy. It just exports. It does just one thing. It exports an FBX file with all any with this kinematics as an FBX animation. It's a keyframe animation. It's not a rig, uh, so it's that basically. But in most cases, and cases, it's sufficient to have it like that. So, for example, we have this roof, which has this uh, incredible complex kinematics, which just you can now use in in VR application to play it back and watch it. So it's an easy way to export your kinematic data to FBX and use it in a whatever target system you want to use it. And just to give you an idea, this file probably takes about 10 to 15 minutes to export it. And another stuff we're working on right now, which is work in progress, is to get the kinematics directly to Unity via um, the joint system in Unity. So it's basically the original CATIA uh, kinematics on this object. That's something we want to uh, work on more because it's enabled us to, to, do this, to use this kinematic in a very good, efficient way in Unity and to view it in VR and manipulate it. And perhaps you can also play it back into your source system. So 
now I will give over to Thanks. Christopher. <laughs> So we've heard something about connecting data, about importing data. Now we have, uh, in my opinion, a really great experience we built for a customer of us. And uh, we're proud to share that with you. Yeah, thanks, Henning. Um, so what we did was um, a, our customer approached us. And what he wanted um, from us was a basically VR training, VR simulation for training um, for training painters for um, paint shops. And um, what the requirements were, um, were that the, the simulation it should be very realistic, so it should behave very realistically. Um, and for us, this also meant, or for the customer, this also meant that um, we uh, wanted that the, the haptical feeling is also very realistic. So what we basically did was to um, hack um, a real spray gun and put a Vive controller in it um, and uh, or a Vive um, tracker on it and um, build some sensors and an Arduino which passes the, the amount you, you, tr you press the trigger to the, to the Vive tracker and then um, to Unity so that you have a really realistic feeling when um, the person is, is spraying um, a work part. Um, so what was also very important, uh, important was the, the uh, educative uh, aspects of the application. So it should contain all the important aspects in the training process of a, of a painter. And um, what is a really a nice benefit of um, having this virtual reality um, uh, paint simulation is that you can have like rich feedback and evalu evaluation mechanisms during the painting process and after the painting process. Um, and we also wanted this whole experience to be very motivating. And I mean, we are using a game engine after all. So what we uh, used were some gamification aspects and um, like achievements, challenges, high score board, uh, board and so on to keep the motiva motivation um, up. So the what the customer um, was hoping and also we were uh, trying to achieve um, were um, some kind of economical and ecolog ecological um, benefits. I mean, economical means that um, it's usually cheaper to have like a, a standard um, laptop with standard hardware instead of having like several painting stations. And ecological means that because the paint is usually not that good for the environment um, for obvious reasons, because they contain like um, hazardous uh, chemicals. I mean, a VR simulation does obviously not contain those. Um, also, um, like more efficient training, uh, so you can have like more training stations in, in parallel. Um, and of course, a coolness factor, because you have usually young people. Um, and um, like having a VR simulation is always something that is very cool for them and that also is also very motivating for them to give their best. So these benefits are currently evaluated. Um, the customer uh, is currently trying it out. So it's already in the field, so to speak. Um, and what's, what I now want to tell you is how Unity helped us to tackle all these challenges. Um, so what we started with was some input from the client in the form of an initial design thinking workshop, um, which sketched out the, the basic ideas, um, what he wanted to have in the end, or what the, the benefits should be also. Um, and what Unity is really great at is building rapid prototypes. So really get something, even if it's very basic, get something up and running very fast. And this is how we used Unity in the whole process. Um, so we started with some initial prototypes, which were already running after about two weeks. Um, and we had our first feedback loops with the client. Um, and from then on, um, after some time, we had two-week sprints. And what we did was we were on site, and we um, handed the Vive controller or the, the, um, the, 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 the spray gun to like really experienced painters, and they tried out the software. And I was sitting there as a developer, really tweaking all the parameters completely within Unity, so um, to get a real realistic behavior um, based on the feedback of the, of the painters. And this is something that really works great with Unity, so it's really short iteration cycles. And as I said before, we are currently, we've already delivered a final version, and this is currently uh, evaluated um, 
uh, and uh, we will see uh, in a few months if um, uh, how the, the ecological and or the especially the economical benefits are, and what the user experience is. Um, so, what we want to show you now is what you what we want to give you now is a short live demo. Okay, so let's start this up. Okay. Mm. So we start by simply calibrating the height. So just press the button. So just imagine for the moment that he's holding like a real spray gun. We, we don't have that here at the moment. Um, what you can already see here is um, the, the like the compartment of the room where the painting is usually done. So we went out to the customer and um, made a 360 panorama and integrated that into Unity. Um, yeah, okay, just go on to the next step. So what you can see here are the, these two modes. There's also an introduction mode, which we uh, left out here. But we have the basic training mode, which is like the whole painting session. And we have a challenge mode, um, which is a gamification aspect, where you have to paint like as many parts as possible in, with a certain amount of paint, uh, and so on. But for now, we are going to do uh, basic training. OK, what you can see, what we do now is like a whole uh, painting process. So in the first step, you, you choose um, the, the work part you're going to work with. So for now, we're choosing this hood. OK, just continue. Um, then what was really important uh, for our customer was um, that we have different types of coat. So different types of paints, basically, that behave differently. So you so that the, the customer can then adjust um, the, um, the, the paint um, and then train different situations. OK, so we just uh, stick with the base coat for now. Um, so this is also a very important dialogue. So what we did here, because you have all these different dials on the paint gun and you want to adjust them, um, and the, the train is also, they should really learn how to adjust them and how they behave. So what you can do is you can um, adjust the, the spray pattern, which is like this round pattern or this elliptical pattern. We just keep it at the moment at the round pattern. And the amount of material that comes out, and especially important is the airflow, which is basically the pressure with, with, with which the, the paint is sprayed out onto the work part. So for the moment, we can de decrease it to 1.5 bar. And what Max can do now is test the setting. Yeah. And what you can see now is that the, the paint basically stays in the middle of this uh, elliptical spray cone. So um, it seems like for this code here, we have to make a different setting. So let's increase it to 2.5. And let's try again. And now you can see that the paint spreads to the edges of the spray cone. So um, it's also not that right. So we set it back to 2.0. Exactly, we can try it out again. OK, there we go. Seems about right. Then we proceed to the next step. And now the real painting process starts. So Max, uh, before you start, we can have a look at all these uh, indicators we have seen. So you have this red spray cone, which uh, indicates um, at which um, portions of the work part the paint is applied. You have these arrows that point towards um, the work part if you are too far away. They also appear when you are too near. They point you um, away from the work part. And um, what you also have, if, you, if your angle is too steep, then you have this red kind of flag appearing that indicates that the deviation from the normal is too large. So it's just all these vis uh, visual clues. And um, I, I don't think some of you may have noticed that. Um, even the sound changes when you change the air pressure, because, because this is something that really experienced painters do. They listen to, to, the, to the spray gun and listen how it sounds, and um, based on that, adjust the, the spray gun settings. OK, so let's give Max a try. You can also hear that when he moves while spraying, when he moves the spray cone away from the work part, the sound also changes. So it 
mimics his real behavior. So what can Max, um, what you could also do is to go really near to the, to the work part and start painting. Then you can see that paint runs up here, which is also a visual clue that you're applying simply too much paint. paint. And maybe, yeah. Uh, okay, so let's proceed to the next step. So one benefit of this simulation is that you have like a real, um, some, some means now to communicate back to the painter what he has done right and what he may Im improve on. So what we can see here at the moment is the pseudo color image, uh, where you can see that the blue regions, they, they, they need some more paint. We have the green regions, which are about right, and we have this red region, which um, where, where too much paint is uh, applied. I mean, we, we just, we provoked that uh, just a minute before. Um, but it, it already gives a, um, a clue um, where the painter can improve. Like a typical thing is that um, like inexperienced painters, they stop at the borders of the, of the bird part um, and instead of like um, going completely to the, to the edge and outside. Um, and this usually means that at the borders of the work part, there's too much paint applied, which in this case is, is still okay. So uh, Max, um, can you press the, the third button from the left? and then on the play button or to the right. So what you can do is you, the, the whole painting process is recorded, so you can like then re-evaluate um, where in the whole paint process you were too near to the work part or where you were too far away with all the indicators we've seen before. Uh, you can always pause that um, as well to have an in-detail inspection. Um, okay, then the fourth button from the left switches on um, the, the path you've traced during the paint process. And in this case, the color indicates uh, the deviation from normal, because usually you should, uh, you should paint um, from a very orthogonal um, position. Uh, in this case, you can see that where the, the arrows are red here, like in this portion of the, of the work part, the deviation was more than, I don't know, 30 degrees or something like that. Okay, then we can try another one, which is the fifth. Yeah, in this case, you can see the, the, post, um, the, um, the pose you had during the painting because some painters, they, um, they tilt the spray gun during painting. In this case, Max always had it up, upright. But this is also something that was, that this was really a feedback that we got from painters. They wanted to have this feature. And um, we built that in, and in the next, um, uh, version we had, and we did our testing again, we already had it within the software. And here we have um, um, the distance. So um, you always have to keep like a, an optimal, there's always kind of an optimal distance. Um, and you can see that um, in this case, Max did really well. So he kept um, the optimal distance on average. And if you are far too far away or too near to the work part, the, the colors um, get red. But no achievement? In this case, no, we had no achievements. Uh, usually, um, um, sometimes you get achievements for like moving very smoothly or keeping the angle uh, right um, for a long time, um, for a long amount. Um, in this case, Max, unfortunately, didn't achieve any achievements. Maybe next time, Max? No high score. <laughs> no high score. OK, so that's about that. Henning? Yeah, maybe to add something, I think the, the real challenging part beyond, beside having this amount of quality and talking back to the painters and getting the feedback in was to build up that data model behind it to track all these parameters during the painting process and having this performance still. Um, the, I don't know the, the, the color or the material of the paint to have it look like a real, real uh, paint with a, with a clear coat was not that important at the moment, but to have this feedback and to, to take a look how it worked was really, really uh, important for the customer. And we also so think maybe you could track these movements and maybe could use it to teach painting robots because I, I thought, I never thought this has, uh, this has, this has been done manual at the moment. I thought everything is with robots, but that's not true, especially when you have small number of cars or individual cars or um, yeah, special uh, uh, editions of a car. The, it's much more expensive to exchange the paint robots in case, in, in, but using uh, uh, manual workforces for that. So, 
As Christopher said, we're waiting for the feedback from the customer, but we assume that it will be very positive because um, during the whole phase of the development, the customer was involved and um, he was really, they never thought this could be feasible to do that and they are really um, yeah, enthusiastic about that. So hopefully it was interesting for you, um, these three topics. Um, feel free to ask any questions. We are still some hours here on the, some hours, huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, on, this, on this expo. Uh, but I think we have 10 minutes left. So if you have questions, please feel free. I didn't. Um, the, uh, the audio is so important. How we ah, did the yeah. recording and the um, how we did the recording. Um, first, we thought about really recording um, the the noises, but we ended up uh, firing up Audacity, this audio editor, and generating white noise, and that's that. That's everything, and this was like already real enough. Um, and we tested that with um, like painters, and they didn't hear any difference from real. And what we did during the simulation were we introduced, which is Unity also very great, um, which always are sometimes neglected um, uh, tools are the audio tools or the audio, audio processing, processing with the Unity. So we use some um, high pass and low pass filters to adjust um, the, the frequency ranges to have the more realistic feedback. Yeah, sorry. You, you mean like putting the paint on, onto the, the work part? Um, that's just more or less basic image processing. So um, there's like a hidden model in the, in the background which kind of tracks the, the, uh, the amount of paint that is applied that is not visible. And we use that um, to, to um, and we map that to ba basically an HSL color model and or like a, um, a, a color range within Unity. And um, from that, we, we generate the texture, which is then applied um, on the work part or on the mesh. And that's basically that. So. The first part, please, again. Ah, okay, I see. Okay, the question was how we got this kinematics to, to the FBX file, basically, okay. Um, in Katia, you build joints and everything basically like the same you do in a game engine, but slightly different, of course, and normally you don't get that information out of Katia. It's encapsulated there. So we use some tricks because we, um, we don't do, as I told you on the second slide maybe, uh, we also have good experience in CAD systems and also programming against them. So we um, come up with the idea to track every, as you see, is a keyframe animation. Yeah? So we, 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 how do you, we drive the, kinema the kinematics second by second by second by second and take snapshots basically and compose, the, compose the, this to a animation, keyframe animation, and then doing it together with the FBX geometry, and that's it basically. So, and also, yeah. No, no, please. Have you tried um, find out the limits of fitness for runtime import of CAD data? Like, import directly into the world? No, we haven't. Every, we are in, as you can see, still work in progress. We, it looks very, very promising, but uh, we haven't pushed it to, to that limit yet. Sorry again, please maybe. Hello. Uh, how do you manage animation with uh, pre-baked light maps? How with pre-baked light maps? Pre light it's, not, it's not possible. We no. We we as soon as you go, there's this 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 fork you have to choose. If you go for maximum quality and you go for less interactivity or you go for more interactivity and then you usually don't use light maps. Okay. But 
again, for example, for a designer, it's very important to see how the light flows, and especially in the, in the um, I don't know the English term, but where you've, in the feet rest of the car, and when you see how, how, how are the shadows flowing there, or there are a lot of design features at the car, so it's important for them to have a real physically correct flowing shadow. Um, so for this case, we do that. Um, but if I would say we have to do maybe car configurator, configurator or something with an experience uh, at the dealership, I would assume it's more important to have interactivity in there, to open doors, to open the glove box and things like this. So I would go there without uh, light maps. But as I mentioned in first, we, the variety of projects coming to us and the needs of our customers are so broad, you have to stay flexible for that. So this is the main reason why we built the, the second part of the presentation, the CMS. If you go directly, if the, the, the workflow would be every time the same, you go from CID to Unity, it's completely sufficient. It might be sufficient to go to Pixies and then go to Unity, but as soon as you have to work in, in, in different software tools with different requirements, it, yeah, it's the way we do it. Welcome. So five minutes left, if someone wants to spray. Sasha, <laughs> come up. There's <laughs> leider die Lackierpistole dabei. I learned it 20 years before. Yeah, he's a, he's a, he's a painter, actually, a lacquerer. So maybe, yeah, stand like this. Okay, calibrate height. You just take training, basically. Yeah. And then you choose, uh, you choose the part with the right arrow. Yeah, take the hood, that's okay, I think. And then continue. Exactly. Take any code you want. Just keep it like that. Continue. And now you're free to spray. It's yeah, yeah, it's just yeah. Normally, there's a part of the customer, so we exchange it with um. No paint on the ground, no. You can also spray the Yeah, achievement. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Finishing. Perfect. Now spray to your to your face. Spray to your face. I mean, you get an achievement normally, yeah, okay. Yeah. But you can go on finish and then you see the result. You go on finish. If you see how, how, you, how you did. Yeah, normally you didn't click out, yeah, yeah. So you can see the color is more towards green. Green is perfect. So there are still some where there's two less color, but yeah. overall a very good result. Really Thanks. Cool. Thank you. And you, it's more like the real yeah, yeah, we, we, have, we have to have a talk <laughs> after that. Okay, that's it. Thank you for your, still some, some questions. I think we have room for one. Okay, then thank you very much and have fun. <laughs>